why aren't Republicans appalled that one of their candidates attempted to put pressure on a secretary of state to find more votes? That's a, that's a pretty awful thing to do. It is, uh, and, and they should be. Uh, and it's the, the state of intellectual brokenness, I think, within the party that uh, and, and cowardice from some that, that keeps them from being it. I, I know enough. I, so, I, I mean, I practice law in Georgia. I, I use the RICO statute in civil litigation. I was an elections lawyer. Some of the election law in Georgia I helped write. This is the one that I, I don't think the Trump team realizes. So to step back for a second, R- RICO is, is the, the racketeering law to try to get organized crime in Georgia. It was tweaked to go after gangs and other crimes. And essentially, what makes the Georgia statute so dangerous for Trump is that they don't just look at what happened in Georgia. So they go and they say, what did this Trump team do in Arizona? What about Michigan? What about Pennsylvania? And if they find this similar patterns there, the Georgia litigators, the Georgia prosecutors can tie all of that into the Georgia case and say it's not just about Georgia. This was a pattern of racketeering throughout the nation and the nexus of it was in Georgia, trying to overthrow Georgia. Here's your proof. Let's play the call with the Secretary of State. And by the way, he conducted these things in other states as well. It makes it a more expansive case than even the federal racketeer in a RICO statute gets, um, tying multiple behaviors out of state to a nexus in Georgia, where he also engaged the behavior, gives the prosecutor in Fulton County a lot of power to advance a case and draw from a jury pool that is less pro-Trump than the one down in Florida with the federal court. Right. And the case is you try to steal an election. Yes. It's, it's a very simple case. And it's extremely hard to refute. Here's my worry. He's, he's found guilty on this stuff. Or, or there's some hung jury or something. And they elect him anyway. What happens I, when a person who is a convicted felon is is not on some trivial thing, but on actually distorting the very fundamental nature of democratic legitimacy is the candidate and con- conceivably the president? This gets us to the the John Adams statement of what the the, the Constitution is is for a moral people. We we get into uncharted territory. The founders of the country could not conceive of a convicted felon becoming president. I mean, the Constitution doesn't contemplate someone being elected who is is a felon. And it could do it. The animus in this country between both sides gets us to that point. And it's, it you know, I say to my my progressive friends all the time, you, you've got to, you got to wind down your social agitation. And of course, they tell me, well, your side goes first. Somebody is going to have to get rid of the existential fear that's in politics. And I don't know that the president is capable of doing it and, and turn this into a more civil conversation for the temperature to come down. Because I do worry that a significant portion of the Republican party would prefer a felon who is in prison and named Donald Trump to anyone else because he fights for them, I, I guess. They, I, the NBC polling, people, a majority of Republicans want someone who agrees with them as opposed to someone who could win. We're, we're headed to that unexplored constitutional territory that's going to be bad for all of us. And there is a loud voice on the right, the illiberal right, that the country's already fundamentally broken and we're no, there's no way for we, us to come back. So screw it all. Let's just burn it down and go with Trump. And These are the people who are betting against the country. And the history of the American people is don't bet against the American people. And I I think at the end of the day, independent voters will revolt from the GOP. And and we're far more likely to see the end of the Republican Party than to see the end of the republic. 